I just wanted to quickly clarify, because you did talk about a myriad of relationships there, but you are specifically talking about the care worker and the care receiver, right? And not like, you know, the employer relationship and all of that, or how does that work? Look, Dorinda, this is where I'm, I, I'm getting myself very tied up in knots, I think, because, uh, and, and this is where I'm, like, it'll be great once I've actually collected my data. I think initially I really started out wanting to focus on the care worker and, and then but there were, I had this kind of hunch that this relationship was important. And then the more I read, the more I think the way the care worker, uh, their relationship with the organisation is, is kind of important as well. So I guess it's kind of starting with that, support worker but then looking at the different um relationships and that that, that are important yep. that kind of might shape their responsibilities okay thank well, you I think by the end of my phd i'll probably be able to say what i'm actually looking at <laughs> <laughs> all right well let's uh, um get to the questions there's three hands that have been raised um greg how about you ask first thanks katie for um <clears throat> And that really engaging presentation, um, well-structured and wonderful diagrams. Uh, a suggestion and a, a clarification question. The suggestion is you might want to look at some of the literature on quasi-relationships, quasi-kinship, quasi-friendship and such, because maybe, you know, this paid relationship between caregiver and care receiver uh, may be able to be conceptualized as a, as a kind of quasi friendship in some contexts. Uh, the question is, I, I'm just unclear whether the, the care providers, um, the, the actual caregivers can be independent contractors that in agency contacts or a family contacts directly, or whether they must be employees of a corporate care provider. So I'd like some clarification on, on that. Thanks. I'm glad you asked that because I can go back to my slide that I chopped out because I didn't think I had enough time. Um, let me just quickly go back to this. Um, and have I taken it out? Tell me I didn't take it out. Here you go. So it's really interesting. So the, the government provides the money to the individual, but then the individual can kind of use that in different ways or and, and, and that's kind of the accountability can sit in different places. So that's um, the, so, so essentially they can actually pay someone directly, but that means that then they have to do their, all of the, everything that, that involves. So that means they need to make sure they pay the person's superannuation, they need to give them holiday leave, all of this sort of stuff. Um, or they can kind of work to get, they can, just pay an organisation to do all of that, or they can kind of have something which is in between. So that's where, so self-management is that idea that, you know, they can, they just do it all themselves um, versus agency management where the agency does kind of most of the work around managing the money and everything that the labour involves. Um, and then they, yeah, and then the person uh, just kind of basically signs off on it. So, and to me, again, that's where it's, this is really interesting because there's all these different variants. And so one of the organisations that I'm planning to focus on does engage with people who, who have all of these variants. Um, so I, I hope that answers the question. Um, but yeah, I'd also like to thank you for that suggestion around quasi relationships. Hadn't heard of it, this is, so I'll be getting stuck into that. Okay, I'll just stop your sharing and I need to find the participants back. There we go, Sam Jardine. Uh, yes, very interesting talk. Um, I have a question and suggestion as well. So at the beginning you mentioned um, that the anthropological literature is uh, digging up the positive relationship examples, but uh, sociological literature is thinking at more as dysfunctional. I was wondering to what extent would this be the product of just anthropologists having more success accessing functional error relationships? Because I mean, for obvious reasons, dysfunctional relationships are less inclined to let people peer into them. And um, suggestion is that, sort of relating to the stuff you mentioned at the end about policy and ethical, um, I guess, uh, recommendations that could or could not come out of this, you might want to look into, if you haven't already, uh, the ethics of care literature, like um, mm. Nell Nodding's in particular, yes. I think. Yeah, that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, I think I think that's a, a very important um, area of literature, which I did sort of t take a look at, but I'm looking forward to getting a bit deeper into that, particularly when it comes to um, the ethics of care for people with disabilities, because that, that kind of 
tends to seems to take things in a bit of a different direction I think because of the kind of history with disability studies around not wanting to be seen as these kind of passive subjects but I, yeah and I love your first question as well and it's not one that I would that I know the answer to um, but I think it's a really great thing to keep in mind the back of my head that you know how is it that the, the ways that you know possibly as researchers might um, and they privilege certain access to certain types of relationships, perhaps, I think is what you're kind of saying. So that's definitely something I think that I could take into account. Okay, thank you. We have um, three more hands that are raised. There's Petra, there's Bernardo and Cheng. We do have to be mindful of time though, because we do have another presentation after this. So if um, each of the questions and the answers can be rather brief, it would be great. Uh, Petra first. Hi, Katie. Thank you. That was very interesting and it sounds like a fascinating project. Um, I am a mental health social worker, so I'll put my cards on the table. And I'm just wondering whether you intend to unpack a bit more and what your views are, if you are, about the inadequacy of the binary view of disability and mental health, and in particular, the deficit model of um, disability and the recovery model of mental health. Um, where participants might have comorbidities as well and um, there might be legal issues present as well and how all that impacts on their unmet needs which would then influence the types of services the NDIA is funding. Mm -hmm. Yeah and I think, that, I think that's something that's really really important and why I've kind of drawn on some of their medical anthropology literature to kind of unpack I guess the ways that um, you know certain thinking about or certain meanings that we assign to uh, you know disability, mental health, whatever it is, might actually then shape um, certain responses. So yeah, I think I think you're quite right, and it's and it's really interesting when you look at now that the NDI is trying to subsume this kind of recovery approach of of that has been adopted in mental health, and there's currently a real like lack of fit with that. So I think I think that's where, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to unpack that more further as I start to collect data as well. Okay, thank you. Bernardo. Hey, Katie, thank you. Really good presentation. Uh, I just wanted to know, I mean, we were moving from that model where we had uh, before local area coordinators planning and uh, thinking about the patients and trying to look in the long way and with this new model that role of the government like state government planning and supervising the the care is not happening anymore i was wondering if as part of your research project you are uh considering interviewing or doing desktop research to understand the new role of the disability services as a government agency or incorporating that role of the state or the government in terms of funding yeah, probably less so here. I do think it's important that I'm, I'm trying to kind of capture it through probably possibly my literature review and then some of the desktop research looking at, um, you know, the different ways, maybe the WA NDIS, the kind of meanings that they made of care and responsibilities versus maybe this, the Commonwealth model. Um, and then, yeah, hoping to talk to a couple of NDIA people. But, yeah, at this stage, I'm plan, planning mainly to focus more on the provision. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Chen Yen Lu. Hey, Katie. Um, what a fantastic presentation. I really enjoyed that. Um, so I just have a couple of questions for you. Um, the first one is I kind of wanted to, to, to know if, um, your project will actually explore any potential overlaps between the NDIS and also the living at home aged care packages that are being offered because um, particularly with uh, the vulnerable group from the 60 plus range, a lot of them are seeking the aged care package, but also mm -hmm. they do have like disabilities on top of that as well. And so I was just wondering, how do they actually divvy up that funding when it's actually possibly coming from two streams of, of resourcing? Um, so I guess I wanted to know if um, you're putting some limitations around your research so that it only focuses specifically on people that are just tapping into the disability 
um, mm -hmm. resources and excluding those above a certain age bracket or whether you're also encompassing people that are in the, I guess, the elderly age group. Um, and the second question, I guess the second thing that I'm really interested in is uh, trying to figure out how genuine is this is this um, care service that's being provided. And I think that it's so difficult to decipher, like just from my own experiences as well. Um, and I guess, because I've just finished my field work, I noticed that the power of volunteers actually plays a significant part in actually providing care, but also offering, um, I guess, a, a, an element of friendship there as well. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you're also going to be looking at that extra pool of resourcing being volunteers as a cohort um, in actually offering, you know, a quality service to people that are seeking it? Mm. Um, those are fantastic questions and things I've really, really grappled with, actually. So there, and, and, and certainly have by no means resolved, but I guess where I got to with the, with the first one was more limiting it in terms of, um, like, my field sites and then kind of, like I guess the policy uh, anthropology approach, you can it has this kind of follow it idea. So I know that one of the organisations that I'll be doing field work in actually supports older adults and people with disabilities. And so, and and this is the whole thing about this project. It just kind of spirals off because there's so many different parts of it. But I thought, well, I'll just start with the people employed in that organisation, and then if it goes down, if the data takes me down the path of needing to look at into the kind of uh, aged care funding and how that is interfacing with the disability funding, then I'll do that. Um, and yeah, the genuine, it's really hard. And that's, I think, why it's so hard, because I think we don't know what it, what it means to have this paid relationship in terms of whether or not it's a genuine relationship. But I think for me, one thing I really notice is when the relationship continues when the funding isn't there. So um, yeah, I hadn't, hadn't considered volunteers at this point because I am really interested in starting with that kind of paid relationship and see, understanding that. But I think it would, I think there's possible down the track that it might really connect well with that, that the type of work that you're doing as well. 